We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. Are As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast. For insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The eagle has landed. Welcome back, everybody. Look, obviously, uh. I like to talk about climate change. I like to talk about energy policy, and and we're at it again. I'm really excited about today's uh, guest. We have uh, Roger Pielke Jr. He's um, at um, University of Boulder, uh, University of Colorado Boulder. Um, really interesting guy, and um, and uh, really a thought leader in um, in the scientific community when it comes to climate science. What's real? What isn't? How you should interpret it? Because it gets confusing. Everybody has their their own interpretations and certainly their own headlines that they write. Um, this is one of the most important issues of our time because it, because it affects, or at least the solutions we derive from the problems that we ascertain to be true or not, those solutions have major effects on our, our lives. Um, whether or not the problems do is another question. And so uh, there's, there's a reason that you always hear me talk about this. There's a reason that I like to uh, do podcasts on this. So today we got Roger. Um, he's uh, He also just wrote a new book. It's called The Rightful Place of Science, Disasters, and Climate Change. So that's probably a pretty good one to check out. He's a prolific writer on Substack page called The Honest Broker. Um, your biography, well, I got it somewhere, but I mean, you're, you're at you're, you're University of Boulder or University of, I, you know, I'm, what's your bio? Because I apparently cannot say it. <laughs> Yeah, Good I'm a to have you. yeah. Thanks for having me. It's great. Um, I'm a professor, uh, University of Colorado at Boulder, um, and I've been here for 22 years. And I worked at the National Center for Atmospheric Research before that. And I write a lot on controversial topics where science and politics meet, and climate change is one of those. Okay, so you know, where do we begin? I mean, the, the you know, you were just telling me. I actually just want to start there because right before we recording, you said you were you were coming up next week to talk to the budget committee at the Senate. Um, assuming about the, this topic, um, and I assume at the budget committee because you know we we <laughs> there's there's an argument out there that we should direct a vast amount of taxpayer dollars and resources to solve the climate change problem, and I always think that's an interesting way to put it because. You know, you in, in policy, in policy is different than science, right? Science, you're you're, you're seeking truth, you're, you're you're debunking things, you're you're doing experiments, you're trying to, you know, falsify arguments. I mean, it's a, there's a process to science. Politics is about preferences and trade offs, and 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 your willingness to take risk, your willingness to impose a cost for a perceived benefit. Now, science is helpful in that because science can tell us what's the benefit of this cost. Like, there's there's, there's usually some kind of formula that you can establish now, not always, because sometimes people perceive benefits. So that's what gets, that's, what's interesting about politics. Okay. That's why I'm a politician. Cause I, I, I think in those terms, um, you know, I like doing this podcast with a guy like you, because if I were your Senator, uh, and, and you were testifying out of five minutes with you, I'd, I'd spend most of it saying whatever I wanted to say, I'd ask you a really simple question. You'd say the answer that, you know, I'd probably want, or maybe I didn't want, or maybe I'd argue with you like I did last week to that other witness, but <laughs> that's always fun too. But I like doing this is why I do the podcast because we have all those moments with witnesses who know a lot of things like you, and we don't really get to talk to them. So I appreciate you being on and, and uh good luck at that, that hearing next week, you know, knock them dead. Yeah. Thank um, you. What's your what's your main message? Like, what's the what's the topic of the hearing, and and what's your main message? Like, what's your opening statement going to be? Yeah, so the, yeah, it's a, you know, and I've testified a bunch of times. I worked on the Hill a bazillion years ago, um, and I got a PhD in political science. So I love you know all things politics, and I'm you know I, lo I love Congress, um, uh, House in particular. Oh, somebody um, loves it. Wow. Yeah. Uh, you're, yeah I mean, it's <laughs> you, are you guys in a club somewhere? People yeah, who love Congress? Are you? Yeah. Are you? Is there like a, like three of you? Like, what do you guys do? And you yeah, they hide us together. In, like, they hide us <laughs> in academic departments. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so you know, the, I I think you know testimony and oversight is really important, and I agree hundred percent with you. It is. It, there's a lot of theater and theatrics, and um, witnesses are posing, um, members are posing, um, but it also creates a record on which legislation is based. And you know, I recognize that when I'm testif testifying later this week. 
um, I'm not just talking to the members of the Senate Budget Committee. The, you know, it's like an all-star <laughs> members of the Senate. Um, I'm talking broadly to my peers, to people out in the public, um, and it's a huge opportunity. And you know, what I'm going to talk about the, the hearing is is about misinformation and climate science. And the title is focused on fossil fuel companies. Mm -hmm. And my, my message is going to be that if we're going to use expertise and science in legislation, policy making, we want good science. And um, right now, you know, climate change, the, the entire thing is a, you know, 10, tens of billions of dollar industry, um, not just, you know, energy, all sorts of energy, renewable energy, fossil fuels, um, mm. but it's, it's a huge industry. And so trying to get good science in the context of tens of billions of dollars of interest is always a challenge. And it, it, it we can't just say, well, I love fossil fuels, so they, their research is okay. Or I love wind turbines, so their mm -hmm. research is. And everybody has to play by the same rules, and that's going to be my message. And I know, you know, in a very partisan environment, asking everyone to play this by the same rules isn't always a popular stance. Well, well, I mean, that's a good place to start. Like, how do you define good science? So, we're really good um, in in North America, in Europe at putting together um, expert advisory committees um, where we gather together scientists um, who have relevant expertise to whatever the question happens to be, um, you know, vaccine safety or uh, nuclear energy or climate change. And, and ideally, people making decisions, policymakers, their staff, people in the agencies, they will come up with questions like, this is what we want to know. So you guys sit down and tell us about it. In the U.S., we have the National Academy of Sciences. Um, we have the, uh, you know, F Federal Advisory Committee Act, under which there are thousands of experts who sit on expert committees. Um, and what they do is they argue with each other, they review the evidence, peer-reviewed literature. And I mean, the interesting th thing about science is like, there's not like a single truth. Um, academics love to argue with each other over really small points. Mm -hmm. And so getting together and forcing people to say, here's what we know, here's where we disagree, here's where we're ignorant, is a really useful exercise. Um, yeah. It's not always right, and it, it's it's not always timely, um, but there are better and worse ways to get at the question, well, what do we think we know right now? Yeah, and that's when we ask that question, what's good science? And it's it's, it's usually, well, there's, a, there's just something called a scientific method, right? That's, that's, a, that's one framework, I guess, with which to approach a problem. There's that rigorous debate. There's that peer review debate, and and you know, but in the end, it, it isn't it just being honest about what we know and what we don't know, and that's that's where the the, the climate science debate gets gets tricky because there's there's, there's definitely this um, this sort of media narrative where we know a lot more than we actually know. Doesn't mean there's not a problem. I'm always on the side of like, look, I'm I'm all for just reducing carbon emissions just as a matter of risk aversion like because what if it is kind of true you know that that's sort of how i take it like and i and, and the evidence suggests like maybe there's something there i as far as i can tell you know with my own scientific background but but i but i so i look to people so as any american we look to people who tr we trust and you know people trust people for different reasons and one of the problems in politics is uh, I don't expect every American to know everything about social social security insolvency or, or tax policy or climate change. How, how can they? But I wish, I I think as a country we do need to get better at um, how would I say this in, in, without what sniffing out bullshit. Like that's we are not. I've noticed and just after being in politics, I've noticed we're not very good at it. And because I'll see something and I'll be like, that's obviously false. Like some a friend will send me an article. I'm like, that's clear, whether it's from the left or the right, by the way, because there's like equal amounts of falsehoods. And I'm like, just the way this is written, the way this is presented, I immediately know it's bullshit right away. And I wish you did too. <laughs> and like now it takes years of experience of seeing it over and over again, I suppose. But like, we need to get better at that. And I guess that's what good science is, right? It's being able to sniff that out. Um and so I guess, where do we begin? I mean, what's the, so let's begin with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. This is the UN's report. Come, it's come out, I don't know how many times. It's an annual or every two years. I don't know, you tell me. But this is considered where we look for the quote unquote consensus. Um, it's a bad word to use because it implies that there's like finalized truth that we've arrived at, which really isn't true. 
But when I talk to people who really look at it, it's it's mostly been decent science in there. It's the headlines written afterwards that are pretty bad. But even but recently you found some things in there that are just crap science. And so is that a good place to begin to to talk about the subject? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the IPCC um, was formed in the late 1980s. And, you know, there's a lot of this, this pressure, you know, the, the scientific community was saying, hey, we're changing the climate. And anytime you're dealing with, you know, a big sticky issue that involves countries around the world and the global economy, you kind of got to get together and, and assess what you know and what you don't know. It was modeled on, on what was done um, for the ozone issue. For, so from the 1970s and 80s, there was an ozone assessment and it worked really well. And so, you know, the, the thinking was, well, that worked well. Let's let's do a, an intergovernmental panel on climate change. Um, it's had six reports. They come out, you know, basically every six, seven years. Um, and they have three working groups, one focused on the physical science of climate change, one on impacts um, and adaptation, and then one on economics. Um, they, they start with the physical science. And, you know, in the, in the real world, they actually start with economics because all of our projections are based on, you know, how we think the world's going to evolve going into the future. Um, and it's been around for a long time, and there's been thousands of people involved. It's had high points and low points. Um, it had um, a number of errors uh, about 15 years ago in a major report. And so there was a, a big um, you know, investigation and reforms put into it. And it, it seems, you know, and we can talk about this. In, in the last report, there were some, you know, unfortunate, unnecessary errors that slipped into the report. Um, and it's always a challenge when you're an expert advisor, you know, and I've written about this when you go before Congress. Um, if, if, if you as a member of Congress are asking me a, a factual question, I could just say, oh, here's the facts. Here's what I think about this. But hey, I have an audience with a member of Congress. I'm going to tell you, here's what you should do um, and put my finger on this scale. And so playing it straight as an expert advisory body is always, I think, a challenge because you have such access and prominence and visibility um, that it's it's hard to resist trying to use that to, to you know, put your thumb on the scale and, and weigh things in a certain direction. And I think that's what, you know, the IPCC has fallen a, a bit into in the last assessment. Yeah, that's unfortunate. I mean, because it, you know, I, I people on I don't know what our side is. Maybe the 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 rational. I, I would call our I, I call ourselves rational environmentalists. Like we care about the problem. We believe there's a potential problem there. I, I believe we have an interest in mitigating carbon emissions, but I refuse to I refuse to accept this alarmism view because I, I, I you're not showing me how that's that's possible. And there's a lot of counter arguments that. That maybe they're maybe they're BS counter arguments, but you haven't told me why, right? And so they're, they're, that and that's the debate. That's science, right? And, and and you're also again you're talking about modeling the future in a very complex environment. It's and so so I also take a step back and I'm like, I don't think you'll ever know. I I don't without being God, I'm just not sure you'll ever know. Um, so I'm going to do the best I can as a policymaker. Um, but it has tended to be fairly accurate and non-alarmist, right? You know, so these sort of red alert headlines they don't come from this report. So I do defend the report often yeah. in public debate, and I, I take statistics from it. I especially the economic ones, because one of the ones I point out all the time is the cost of climate change from the IPCC. And it's like, because because th that's what I care about as a politician. Like, what is the actual cost? And if if the if the scientific consensus is telling me that the cost in these bad scenarios is like four and a half percent less GDP than we otherwise would have in a hundred years, I, just to be clear for people, like that's that's practically a meaningless cost. But to do, but on the other hand, the cost of, you know, a zero carbon world is like $9 trillion a year. I, I mean, and it, I'm not even sure that actually accurately captures the cost because you're, you're not accurately capturing the, 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 the massive difference in quality of life that humans would perceive because you wouldn't have energy. So um, like, I mean, you really seriously wouldn't the way you have now, but so I just compare those two costs and I'm like, one's bigger than the other, <laughs> it's like way, way bigger. So maybe we should pause and, and then think for a second. So, so what did you specifically look at in, in this particular report that kind of raised some eyebrows? Yeah. So for me, um, you know, in my areas of expertise, there was two things I, I really singled out in the report as, as deeply problematic. Um, and they're both pretty technical, but um, you know, the first one is, is the use of scenarios of the future. You know, you're talking about long-term costs projected out to 2100, and, and you know, I hate to say it, but um, all those numbers are pretty much meaningless 
um, <laughs> right now. And, you know, long story short, my view is the only way climate policy works is if policies can be put in place in the short term. So by short term, I mean the electoral cycle in the United States, two, four, six years um, that people see benefits from. And you add all those up over decades and, you know, the better part of a century and we've decarbonized. Um, the long term, you know, forecasts of, of costs, I don't I don't trust at all. So in climate science, they they use scenarios of the future. So if you want to know how climate's going to change, one of the things you want to know is, well, how much emissions are there going to be in the future, carbon dioxide emissions? Well, to answer the question, how much carbon dioxide emissions are we going to have, you have to know how many people are going to be on the planet? How big is the economy going to be? What energy technologies will they use? What energy technologies will produce those, the fuels that we use in the future? And it turns out, that the most popular, the most widely used scenario in climate research is more than 20 years old. It's extreme. It says, implausibly, we're going to throw away every energy source we have except coal. We're yeah, I, yeah. It was, there's a name for it. It's like the R. It's called RCP 8.5. Yeah, and it's it. it it's based on an academic theory from the 1990s um, that said that, you know, when, when we use a technology, we get better at it. And when we get better at it, it becomes cheaper and it eventually takes over. And cool. so, so, but it's the opposite of what's actually been happening. That's right. That's well, right. Well, in, in America and in the West, at least, it depends on what country you're talking about. Right. But sure. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, China and India are still using coal because it's easiest for them. And, you know, Xi Jinping has said, we're all on board with decarbonization, but we're going to have the, we're going to have the alternative before yeah. we change. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so we're not going wholesale. And even in the, the, right now, the most pessimistic scenarios um, have, have coal emissions plateauing, not going through the roof. So, so climate science is um, a lot of climate science is, is driving forward by looking in the rear view mirror. And so when, when we get the IPCC report and the top line assumptions and the projections of how hurricanes are gonna change and rainfall and temperature, if they're based on this scenario, and most of them are, um, we're getting a distorted view, a much more extreme apocalyptic view of the future. And what's the temperature change according to that scenario? It's it's, it's like four degrees Celsius. It's about it? four degrees. I think it's three point seven degrees, and it has yeah. a you know Which uncertainty around that. Significant, especially in the equatorial it, lines, it would be, right? It would, it would be, be a be... big deal. Yeah, that would be a big deal. But, but no, no. Can you? We'll go ahead. We'll finish that. Yeah, I was just gonna now. say. Well, just to, to to close the the loop there. I mean, if you take a more plausible scenario of the future, we're looking at something like 2.7, 2.5. We just did a paper that yeah. said the median estimate is 2.2. The point is we're a lot closer to that two degrees target. I say like if if if, if you went in a time machine and you went back mm -hmm. 20 years and you talked to climate scientists and you said, hey, in 2023, we're thinking the worst case scenario is is maybe three degrees. They would they would say, oh my gosh, what did we do to 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 you know yeah. to, to make Excellent. so much progress? Wow. <laughs> well, so, but that's why they changed the, that's why they changed the goal to one point five. Yeah, it's it, I mean it's interesting. The one point five degree target was the result of a campaign, very successful campaign, obviously, because you know at the we time were, we, were, we were making the two. Well, that's why because right. they were like, wait, we got to keep going. <laughs> yeah, that's, I mean, yeah, well, no, it was it was mainly because at the time they were using concentration targets, you know, which were a long time in the future. We already had passed at the time that the concentration was three fifty parts per million, and so the idea was it's a lot easier to advocate that there's a problem if we've already passed the target than right. you know your your kids are going to experience it. I guess, you know, a lot of people have a really basic question about this science. Okay. So those are the models, but there's different, right. there's RCP 8.5. There's, isn't there like RCP five? I don't, I, I can't remember what the different 6.0, 4.5, 2.6. Yeah. But, but they're, they're all using different assumptions, yeah. you know, and that, that's the thing about a model. Um, you can, I don't know how many thousands of factors are put into this. I would hope as many as possible, but the thing is, and the reason that they're always a little shoddy is because it's an infinite number of factors that will affect a hundred years from now an infinite, um, you know, you know, is it plant growth? Like we, we've had 30% more greening over the last 20 years. I'm not sure any of the models expected that or took that into account. That's obviously a carbon suck, not a carbon emitter. Anyway, you know, a basic question a lot of people have is this concentration question. Like why does, why does 400 parts per million? Why is that such a big deal? We've had other points in history where it was way, way higher. Why was that? Why, why is it so bad? And, and then the second question, and I guess related to that question, it's really the same question is how, how good is our, 
how confident are we in the fact that that is the the single biggest driver for a warming planet? That is a constant question I yep. get, and I'm like, I'm not really sure we know that for sure. But like, what's the scientific answer? Yeah. So, I mean, I would encourage my 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 dad's a retired, pretty famous atmospheric scientist, and and I had him write uh, a Substack for my for my Substack to answer exactly this question. And the short answer is, I mean, this, and this is not, I mean, even the deepest skeptics will admit this. By by burning fossil fuels and emitting carbon dioxide, we're altering the energy balance of planet Earth. And the way that it works is that we're accumulating heat in the Earth system. And mm -hmm. so that's that's basic physics. So the next question is, all right, so what? So we're accumulating heat. heat. So it turns out that that poses some risks. And anyone who tells you, yeah, I know the future with 100% certainty, they don't know. Um, and it's always a risk management question. And, and if, you know, the Earth's a complicated system, and if we're changing the energy balance, there's going to have consequences. And and I'm very much of the view that, that and this is what the late Steve Schneider said, that I can come up with a set of scenarios where it looks really bad. Apocalypse is coming. And I can come up with another that says, oh, it's pretty benign. You know, we'll have some green plants and, and everybody will be happy and it'll be a little bit warmer. And we're not really uh, able at this point to say, here's what the climate will look like with certainty in 2070, 2080. But, so but, all, but, yeah. but it is true that, but we can't really put like a number to it, you know? So yes, it's true that it, it, you, you put more of this type of gas into the atmosphere, it does create some kind of greenhouse effect. It does create a warming effect. But again, the skeptics will come back and be like, 400 parts per million, you know, 0.00, 000, whatever, 4% of the atmosphere. You're telling me that that has, that that has actually has an effect at all, really? Like that's, that's their response. So what do you yeah. say to that? Yeah. I mean, it's a little bit like saying, I mean, you're telling me this little, little, thimble full of arsenic is going to kill me. I mean, it's not even as big as a, <laughs> as an apple. So yeah. that, I mean, that's the wrong side of the, the equation. I mean, one thing that scientists know um, really well, and this is really over the last 20 years, is that the, the heat content of the earth system, mainly the oceans has increased dramatically. Mm -hmm. And um, the fact that carbon dioxide forcing is leading to changes in the system, that's, that's less controversial. Um, yeah. Yeah. Then you know that's, that's how I understand thing. it too. Yeah. What other factors could be blamed? Like, is that and if you again, you're, if you're having this because you're you're like you're part of this new movement. I would actually call it a newer movement of like you and Bjorn Lomberg and Michael Schellenberg. Are like, no, it's real. It's just like we're trying to be rational about how real it is. Okay, but that that's a newer thing. It used to be just denier versus alarmist, and luckily the, there's a there's a newer debate here, and I that's 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 how I feel. I, yeah. I I'm part of that group as yep. well um but that but but i even and especially in my own side I, I still deal with people who are like no there's absolutely no truth to this and so it's it's good to talk to them too and be like yep. like uh, there is some like it's not nothing okay so um so the other argument i kind of forgot what it is as i as i explained that but okay so it's it's the concentration is too low it, it, it doesn't matter oh the other one would be like the just other factors, like how do you know that it's this particular factor, considering there are many factors that could lead to a warming planet? How do we know it's this one in particular that is that is the the the, the, the most dangerous one? Yeah. So so if you look at the IPCC report and you talk to climate experts, one of the you know eye opening things is that um, we we humans have a big footprint on planet earth you know, get in an airplane and look down we change the land surface um we we i mean i was in southeast asia for a lot of the spring i'm on sabbatical and so much burning of agricultural land um and forests that you know it, it changes the 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 mm -hmm. albedo um and so we have a huge impact on the planet and if you you actually go through the exercise of saying all right let's quantify what that impact is um, scientists will argue a bit over, well, how much does land use affect climate versus carbon dioxide? But there's really, I mean, the, the debates are over what the magnitude is, not the existence of the effect. Sure, yeah, exactly. So, and, and so so where, where's the good range of the magnitude? Would I guess it's a better way to phrase, phrase that question. Like 2%, 50%, what? It, so the IPCC concludes that, that human influences are responsible for 100% of the temperature increase that's been documented globally um, over the last hundred years. It's a lot easier to document these things at a global scale than to say, you know, this storm or, you know, mm -hmm. this tornado occurred. But at the global scale, I think there's a pretty strong con consensus about, you know, what are the first order 
uh, impacts on climate and what's the magnitude been. The oh, assumption yeah, but, is that that the climate would be pretty stationary in the absence of these forcings. Okay, I, again, but so the what the counter argument says is, but before the, I mean, before there was really emissions from the human race, you know, in the early 1900s when there we really were not emitting much, there was there was pretty significant warming. So like, how do we account for that? Yeah, so uh, you know what uh, some scientists will say, like Judy Curry and others, is that well. The background natural variability of the climate system hasn't been fully incorporated, and we don't fully understand that. I, you know, my view would be sure, let's accept that. It doesn't take away from the fact that we're still impacting the climate. So, even if someone were to say, you know, you know, we're impacting the climate and there's more natural variability, to me, that's like, oh, we should be even more concerned because things could things could happen that that we don't anticipate or we haven't built into models, and we have we have more uncertainty about the future. So, so for me, I mean, if when I have discussions with people about climate science, you know, I, I lay out here's what the scientific community says, and you know, you believe it or don't believe it. The good news is, I mean, from a policy perspective, even if you completely throw out climate change, there are still good reasons why we want to decarbonize the economy. We've, sure. the, the economy has been de decarbonizing for you know a hundred well, years. But when it, when you hear from a report that it's a hundred percent, I'm like. Now my spidey senses went off again because I'm like, how the hell can you possibly, given the very, given the, given the knowledge of natural variability and just the knowledge of our own history without human influence, how on earth can we say that, well, this time it's hundred percent humans. Like how, how can they be so certain that, that so yeah. that's, that's a little frustrating. I mean, do you agree with that hundred percent calculation? I, so I would say that, that the, there are a range of scientists who have been, ostracized excluded from the process who would who would disagree with that and whose views probably ought to be considered but that there is no way shape or form that they represent you know a majority or you know, of the scientific community but i mean that for, from a policy perspective it doesn't really matter if it's 40 percent 63 percent or 100 percent it's a big impact it's and it's having an influence and so um, well it does fact, but it but it does but it does and here, here's why it yeah, matters yeah. because because if the world's going to end in 12 years like somebody says it is then it is worth the $5 trillion freaking green new deal. But if it's, you know, so it does matter. Like, and that's why, that's why I look at the IPC costs. And when you're telling me those don't matter, I'm like, well, shit, like, what am I supposed, like, which was true. Like how, I mean, I, I don't understand how you can be so certain about some things and so uncertain about other things, but like as a politician, I do have to look in terms of like, like, okay. So if the, like the goal is human flourishing, like that's, that's the goal. And, and if the, if the planet bakes into a fireball, then that's bad for human flourishing. Um, so, you know, if there's, if there's massive weather events that there's, we've never seen before in our lives, then I, that's bad for human flourishing. Um, but also uh, destroying people's livelihoods is bad for human flourishing. And so I do have to weigh those costs. And so trying to arrive at the most accurate answer is actually important because a hundred percent is different than 50%. Um, so, yeah, yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's, I mean, the hundred percent is, is global temperature change, not a hundred percent, you know, related to cost or econ once you get into economics, it becomes, you know, a, a much different. <laughs> much yeah. Yeah. No, no, I know. And I'm not conflating those two <laughs> things, but it's like, it's right. like, it's all our fault really. Anyway, it matters a little, yeah. you're, you're, you're right. It's like, as long as we're all on the same page of like, look, right, there right. is an effect and we have a mitigate, we have an, I, we have a, re we have reason to want to mitigate it, right. but but I'll argue with others about how fast we mitigate it and at what cost, because, and that cost is dependent on how bad the problem itself is. Right. You know? And so, and so the IPCC data is, is getting at that, that question, like how bad is the problem itself? Okay. But let's move past that. So, so, yeah. so, cause I want to get it from a, cause I, we consider you like a rational objective person. And so it's good to hear that from you. And, 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 and like, you know, I, I'm, I'm asking those questions some, right. a little bit for me, but also for people listening um, but let's get to some of the problems. And this is where, this is where the, the climate science gets really, really crappy, which is when you're talking about weather events. And I think that's some other stuff that you found in there that you really didn't like. Yeah. So I've been working on extreme weather and climate change really for more than 25 years since I was a postdoc. And, and the context is it, it, it's about mid 2000. So about the time that Al Gore's movie came out, um, the, the, climate advocacy community decided, you know what, we have to bring climate change home to people. You know, it's not enough to say, oh, the temperature is going to increase in 100 years or whatever. And so there has been, and it's, this is, it's well documented, an organized campaign to make extreme weather the face of climate change. 
Mm-hmm. And the problem with that, <laughs> the, all, the problem with that is the science hasn't cooperated. Mm-hmm. So if you go and you, and it's really important to go phenomena by phenomena, um, the scientific community has um, pretty good certainty that uh, heat waves, extreme temperature events have increased um, in many places around the world. There's also um, some uh, good understandings that uh, heavy rainfall, not the same as floods, but heavy rainfall has increased and what's called fire weather. So hot and dry conditions that, that lead to fire, not fires themselves. Um, and also um, soil moisture deficits. So so not not meteorological drought, not hydrological drought. Now, hurricanes, floods, tornadoes, the big ones that you always see in the headlines. Um, over the long term, the IPCC has been very consistent. They cannot, and the technical word is attribute, attribute changes in these events to greenhouse gas emissions or other human causes. So at some point, it's really interesting because at some point, the strongest climate advocacy messages departed from the IPCC. So when I used to testify before Congress in the early 2000s, I was always invited by Democrats. Democrats were always citing the IPCC. Um, After this change to more focus on extreme weather as the face of climate change, um, I see more and more Republicans citing the IPCC and I get invited by Republicans now. Um, And so the IPCC hasn't changed his message but the, the politics around the message has, has changed dramatically over the last 15 years. Uh, that, that is really interesting. Um, okay. So I mean, not attributable. That's different than, so has there even been real changes? I, I see different data on this. I mean, I'm, I'm from what I, you know, when we look at landfall Atlantic hurricanes, it doesn't, the data I thought I've seen, there hasn't even been changes, let alone changes attributable to climate change. They just haven't really been changes, period. So, I mean, this is where it's really important for people to understand, you know, what climate change means and to be precise. Climate change means a trend that's observed over many decades, you know, one direction or a- another. And if you go back to 1900, and, and that's, you know, we may have better, you know, good records before that, but let's start at 1900. Um, there is no, no up or down trend in either U.S. landfalling hurricanes or um, major hurricanes. And, you know, we mm-hmm. can, we, that's only a small part of the world. We can go to tropical cyclones or on planet earth and over the long term. similarly, no long-term trends. Yeah. The most interesting thing, and you, you'll probably know this because you're from Houston, the most interesting feature of the U S uh, hurricane record was a period from 2007 to 2017, where there was yeah. no landfalling major hurricanes. And, mm-hmm. so, and, you know, I, I often talk to people like young journalists and people who came of age during the time where you know a decade where the u.s didn't have any major hurricanes that's the most striking feature so if if that's when you're you know you flipped on your climate change switch and you started paying attention of course you're going to think there's more hurricanes because over that little short time period there have been but that you need to look at all the data to to get a sense of climate change there was no hurricanes in that 10-year period no major hurricanes yeah and then what happened in 20 then and then what happened in 2017 we had yeah, it was it was like a lot of pent up aggression from nature. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, because I mean we had Hurricane Harvey, right. and, and, and like and, you know, and it's 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 just impossible to know. Like, is that just is that you know that's a funny way of putting it, pent up aggression? But there's probably a scientific term for that, right? Like, there's sort of this like reserve energy that just hasn't been let loose, and then it does. I mean, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't know if that's climate yeah, science it's, or not. I mean, this is but, people are seeing you know what what's technically called climate variability is that that you know we have. El Nino, La Nina, people have probably heard of, those mm-hmm. profoundly affect landfalling U.S. hurricanes. Um, there's less in El Nino, more in La Nina. And so one thing that we've discovered is that the human mind is really, really not a good tool for observing climate change because we're, we're here a short time and we're always in one place. And so if, you know, if I say, well, you know, in Colorado this year, it's been really cold and wet. Um, this summer, that must be climate change. You know, I'm fooling myself because you need right. long-term data and, and evidence to be able to to judge that, which is why, you know, the science is so important. Yeah. And yeah, I've done other podcasts on that with guys like Michael Schellenberger, who, we, you know, we go through the actual data on like what's changed and what hasn't, yep. what the costs are and, and what's, you know, and th- again, this attribution theory seems, seems really shoddy, but okay. So in the IPCC, you did say that they've, they've, they have noticed, um, what was what did you say? More droughts or more heat waves? Well, there's 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 a trend. Like how much more heat waves would we say there are now than before? And you know, uh, uh, by the same token, cold fronts, cold spells. I don't know what we would call them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
you know, and is, and is that, and do they attribute that to human activity completely? Yeah. yeah. It's a hundred percent. So, so I, again, the, the, the attribution for anything other than global average surface temperature is at a lower level of confidence. Okay. Um, and it gets even lower when you get to, you know, particular regions. The United States is really interesting for heat waves because if you start in 1960, there's been a noticeable uptick uptick in in heat waves in the u.s maybe you know doubling or tripling i don't know what the exact number is mm -hmm. um but if you start before the 1930s there's yeah. not because the 1930s were so extreme yeah. so i mean cl climate data is like a cherry picker's dream because i'm i mean i tell people you tell me what message you want i can probably go out and play with the data and, and come up with that message right. it's, it's it's that complicated. I mean, and that's what annoys me about the the 100 certainty that a uh, global temperatures are due to i mean if you told me 80 percent, i'd be like okay okay i got it but 100 because because of the, the that the 20th century was so variable and you just can't attribute human activity to like the, those early heat spells i mean imagine these days if we had a dust bowl type type event People would be freaking out. There, you know, there would be there be, there would be climate activists burning cars so that we wouldn't drive them anymore. I mean, it would be it would be bedlam. <laughs> like, but it happened back then, and there's no way you could attribute it to human activity, right? I mean, I, am I crazy to say that? Well, it might have been at least partially due to human activity, you know, which is in, in land use in the in the Midwest and and, and Western United States. I don't know. Um, we would have been able to prove that by now, I would think. But oh, there are um, certainly, yeah, there are theories about how that contributes. But I mean, we're seeing that to some degree this year. So ocean temperatures are are off the charts worldwide, and there's a lot of people asking questions about the Hunga Tonga volcanic eruption and you know, the amount of water vapor it put up into the mm -hmm. stratosphere. And I, I mean. It's, it's uh, uncomfortable for the scientific community, but you know the books haven't been closed on everything we know about the climate system and how it works. So we should expect more more scientific surprises, more knowledge, um, and that's a good thing because we'll yeah. know more. But it, it also says that you know, and I agree with you. If somebody expresses something with 100% certainty, you know, they're probably not looking <laughs> everywhere for for all yeah, the evidence. Right. So back to this, the the hurricane thing is what, yeah. what you point out and. And some of your writings, they actually changed some language in this last report, which is why you're pissed off about this last one. Maybe pissed off isn't the right word, but you're you're skeptical about this last report because they literally had the right language. And they so explain that and they changed it. To yeah, something else. this is one where um, it's like a game of telephone. Um, you know, the report goes through different drafts and so on. Mm -hmm. But the long story short is that um, there's a paper that studied. Um, observations of hurricanes. So they counted the number of times we sampled the, the atmosphere um, in a hurricane. And at some point along the way in the drafting, that went from counts of observations to counts of hurricanes. And it's a simple error that wasn't caught. Um, and it made its way all the way from the first draft when it was correct to the second draft, to a final draft, to the, 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 the um, assessment working group report, to the big synthesis report. And it's at the end, it's just misinformation because it says that the proportion of uh, major hurricanes worldwide has increased um, and it, they haven't. And so for me, the IPCC is so important that it needs to be held to high standards. But that's such a basic, that's a, such a basic fact. Like how does that, I don't so understand I, how that it's even happens. Yeah, so I had, so, so uh, a high level, person in the IPCC emailed me, read my sub stack, you know, confidentially and said, you are correct. This error got through. Here's how it got through. It was inserted outside the review process. So for me, that says, hey, you guys got to tighten up your, your processes. This is a scientific assessment. It's not, you know, it's not a promotional brochure or something like that. Yeah. Um, so you know, for me, yeah, and I think saying pissed off is fair. The IPCC needs to do better to make sure that this sort of thing doesn't happen. I mean, others have documented other mistakes. I've documented a few others. Um, these are of sufficient magnitude that the IPCC should say, all right, we, we got to you know take a step back. We're, we are important and we're so important. We got to get it right. And are they trying to do things about, you know, because some people would say, well, I mean, look at the, look at the simple damages by, by extreme weather. They're so much bigger than they were, you know, at, at another point in history. Now, the obvious answer to that, and any study that's been done on it would show that, well, that, yeah, that's because more people with big homes that are expensive and have high costs and high insurance live there. They didn't live there before. So, I mean, there's a really simple explanation. It's kind of like wildfires. Like this, there's a super simple explanation for this poor forest management. Um, somebody goes and starts a fire. And, and, and yes, is, is it worse if it's dry? 
um, and hot as opposed to wet and what like and cold. Yeah, I mean, that's that's sure that's basic fire science. Like, I, I'm sure it is now. And again, I, I always have trouble. OK, so on this particular day, you're telling me that if there was no humans on Earth, this particular day would be 10 degrees cooler and maybe raining. Like, there's no way you can say that. There's just that's an impossible conclusion to come to. And so I, that's why I just say, you know, I'm like, I'm like, what can and, and, and so as a good policymaker, you should ask, well, what can we do now? I don't know, forest management, I mean, you know, whatever that means, it usually means clearing debris out of the forest, getting logs out. So there's not as much tinder to just flame up. And the forest management is not some, some, uh, some, some new frontier. Like we, we know how to do it rather well. Um, that's likely what the, what the problem was in Canada. I haven't studied that particular fire. Um, but you know, Canada isn't known for being super hot. <laughs> so right, right. like, or, 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 or dry. So I'm not, I'm not really sure you can attribute it the climate change. Um, but it, 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 I guess, okay, so let me get to a question. The, the IPCC, does it, are, are, are people starting to use those those faulty cost metrics as a way to make their point about weather events? Yeah, I mean, that. so this is one of the things I've written about a lot. And it, it's really, since I've been, I mean, probably because it's personal for me because I've been studying it. Um, but you you hit the nail on the head. The reason we have more costs, I mean, it's a, it's kind of a good news story. We're a lot wealthier. People, the average the average home size in the U.S. is is sixty percent larger than it was, you know, fifty or sixty years ago. There's more stuff in them. Um, I I worked for a NOAA. National Oceanic and Atmospheric mm -hmm. Administration um, Cooperative Institute for 16 years. I love NOAA. They do great work. They save countless lives. They also are addicted to this thing called billion dollar disasters. Um, they put out a press release four times a year with a count of how many billion dollar disasters there are, and they attribute it to climate change, not building neighborhoods in <laughs> reservoir bottoms or putting expensive houses on the coast, which is the, you know, the, the overwhelming main reason why we see more billion dollar disasters. Um, it goes with being a wealthy society. I mean, there never yeah. was a billion do dollar disaster until the end of the 1960s. So does yeah. that mean we had, we had no extreme weather before then? No, it means we're right. not rich. Like, I, like I, I can show you pictures of Houston in the 1930s under seven feet of water, like raging, you know, and, and we act like Hurricane Harvey. It just could never happen. It would never have happened before. And I'm like, no, it, it definitely did. There's There's pictures and videos of it. Um, no, there wasn't as much damage because there wasn't as much people. It, it really is that simple. And no, it does put out good stuff. I mean, I cite one of their statistics a lot, which is, yeah, there's, so so I think one of their stats, and I don't know how old this, I think this was a few years old, maybe it's changed since then, but you know, they'll say, look, there is going to be some, potentially some increase in intensity by like 5%. That was the, that was the statistic, 5%. I was like, okay, 5% was that, okay, big deal. But a 25% decrease in frequency so I'm like, well, that's good news. So, so I mean, everything's a trade-off, and, and like we're guessing again. If you're modeling the future, you're guessing. But um, is that is that still an accurate assessment? It's a little bit yeah. Of an older so, study. so NOAA NOAA's uh, geophysical Flu fluid dynamics uh, research lab just put out an updated statement on the consensus on hurricanes, and it's there's a huge uncertainty. I mean, if you actually look at the models, you know, again, mm -hmm. you you tell me what you want, I'll show you the model. But NOAA says, you know, the the, the center of gravity and and that. Uh, of the modeling is that yeah it'll be a um, perhaps you know a little bit more intense for the strongest storms and less storms overall in the Atlantic so so your summary was pretty it's you know it's still pretty accurate the flip side of that I mean people can argue about attribution all they want great you know have your arguments about the past the question you anyway, know I think the important question for policy is if you know if we implement policy A B C or D what's that going to do to the extreme events next year five years from now thirty years from now and it turns out. Um, and we've done research on this. If you take some of the most aggressive climate policy scenarios and you plug those into a climate model, we can't detect the difference for 10, 20, 30, 100 years on these. So, so you know, whatever is coming our way, whether it's natural variability, human caused climate change, or a combination of the both, um, we know we have to, you know, better adapt to forest fire, heat waves, you know, tropical cyclones. They're coming. And, and, you know, we're not, we can't stop them through energy policy. So um, for me, you know, preventing extreme weather is probably pretty far down the list on climate policy reasons. And we better come up with some better ones if we're going to, you know, sell it to the American public and to politicians. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of a good point. Like what are, what are the better reasons than just heat waves, heat waves, is that a more attributable phenomenon or just like hot, especially in the equatorial latitudes, is a, a hotter environment in general where it's already kind of hot. 
Um, yeah. Like, well, because like, because this gets to the cost element, right? Because you know, because I'm because I and again as a politician, I'm like, wait a second. So there's really not going to be the big change in extreme weather, like a little bit here and there, but nothing we can't handle. And and frankly, we've gotten, you know, proportionally speaking, because there's like there's cost overall total, but then there's proportionate costs considering our population, and those costs have, have massively decreased because right. we're just better at adapting to to harsh environments. Um, you know, we have air conditioning. It's a thing uh, that keeps you safe from heat waves, and uh, right. when we have and we have heating that keeps us safe from extreme cold. So, obviously, we're better at adapting. So there's a, there's that cost element to it. But then again, but at the same time, you don't want this this re, you know this Armageddon like scenario. But that doesn't seem very likely at all. Um, but so, I mean, yeah, it, what, what is what is the best argument? Yeah. So the best argument is, you know, I, I pivot from climate change pretty quickly talking about energy policy, you know, to, to recognizing that, hey, that, you know, however you want to count it, there's there's three, four billion people around the world who don't enjoy energy services like you and I have every day and we take for granted and they're going to want them. And they are, mm -hmm. they're getting them. And so energy consumption globally is going to expand massively in coming yeah. decades. And there's two two points there. One is um, people will use the cheapest, most readily available, most secure energy supply they have. And so that's why China and in India are, are, are staying with coal and why Europe and the U.S. are getting off of it, because we can. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, if, for example, Europe, if you want to get off of Russian gas, um, then you need to have an alternative technology because turning off the lights isn't going to work. Deindustrializing Germany isn't going to work. So there, there's a technological challenge. Um, I really think of climate policy as, as an energy technology challenge that we want better technologies. We want them cleaner um, across the board, not just you know carbon, but air pollution, um, you know the, the effects of mining and so on. And we want it to be more secure. Supply chains are a big deal. Um, countries are vulnerable. And so um, I'm, I'm a, a big fan of, of, you know, what has been called an all of the above. I don't, I don't you know, I don't know what the, the successful energy technologies will be. Um, I, you know, I, I, I was around for the light bulb war of 2011 when people were arguing about incandescence versus compact fluorescence. And I mean, now you go to Home Depot and, and you know, you have the great light bulbs uh, that are LEDs and nobody argues about it anymore. Why? Right. Because of because of technology. So, you know, who knows modular nuclear, if, if that takes off and, you know, people are, are comfortable with it, um, that might be the technology that powers most of the continent of Africa. Who right. knows? Um, so, so for me, you know, a constant improvement in energy consumption. Um, I mean, people, you know, everybody's talking about electric cars now. There will be a time where the electric car will be like the the in, the the incandescent light bulb um, debate, where everybody will have the LED, the electric car, and it will seem like, you know, why were people ever arguing about this? Well, right. we're we're in the technological change part of the the, the S curve, and um, you know, once we get to the other side, it, it, we won't argue about it. But it, in the meantime, it's it's political, and it's the same thing like with agricultural productivity, um, public health. Um, we need technological innovation to, you know, make incremental sustained progress. Energy is the same way. So, you know, when, when, when I talk to people about, you know, what are the reasons for accelerating the decarbonization of our energy system? Um, you know, the one, the arguments that I find work the best with the most people are, you know, the climate arguments work with the climate people, but talk about economics, talk about energy security, um, talk about you know safety those things are what people seem to care about a lot more um, and if i was going to build a you know a bipartisan it's a <laughs> it's just a dream a bipartisan approach to climate policy i would get off climate and get onto energy pretty quickly yeah no i mean I, so i agree with that general argument that's basically what we've started doing if you look at the conservative climate caucus you know full of me and others and Yep. that make these arguments we just we just we just we definitely just bypass the the climate change debate all i mean i've i haven't done that in this podcast because yeah, i think yeah. it's interesting to talk to a guy like you and 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 go a little deeper and, and and unpack what we know and what we don't know a little bit more i find i just find it interesting out of curiosity but for as far as the politics of it go yeah i just bypass that i, I don't go have that argument with someone because you know it, it, it except to say unless they're an alarmist you know if they're an alarmist i'm like well, that's just incorrect that is that is an incorrect interpretation of the facts and i can't let you get away with that because if i do then we justify extreme costs uh in the now for some 
uh, idea that we might have San Diego weather in the future if we just um, got rid of fossil fuels, but that's just not true. So like I, and I can't, I can't let you destroy society now for, you know, so, so we do have to, I, I would say like, you got to push back a little bit on, on some of the more extreme ideas about what's true and what isn't, but for the most part, bypass it and say, okay, look, fine. The goal is to reduce carbon emissions. That's it. So if that's the goal, then what would we do considering energy consumption and demand will increase by 50% just within the next 30 years? Um, like that's a fact. It's an unavoidable fact, unless you just hate people and want them to die and starve. And, and, and to be fair, I think a lot of the radical, radical environmentalists are actually anti-humanists. So, I mean, they, they openly say that. So I, I think I'm not incorrect in believing that. And so there's a nihilism that, that, that exists there. For the most part, people are, I, I think, have been fooled into being scared to death. You know, you, you talk to kids with high anxiety about climate change and you're like, whoa, like it changes. Yes, but it's it's not you don't need to be scared. And also you need to think about what would actually reduce and mitigate those effects. And there's two things. One is, um, you know, a better economy, because if you have a better economy, you're better at resilience. Right. You have you have more money to pay off for insurance. You can build houses better. You can build dikes and dams and the kind of things, you, whatever, if you're, if you're dealing with rising sea levels which I, you know, by all indications, we will be no matter what we do right. it's been raising. It's been rising for a thousand years. I'm not sure if it's, if it's accelerated or not, maybe that's another kind of climate debate question. Right. Have they, like, what is the deal with that? There, so the, again, the, the, the time series is short. And so there has been a, a small acceleration in recent decades. And then there's arguments over attribution and variability. Um, but, you know, again, getting back to the extreme climate scenarios, um, the most extreme scenarios of sea level rise to 2100 are, are now off the table. I mean, it's quiet. Nobody talks about it. But in the most recent update to sea level projections, the U.S. government, NOAA in particular, took off the table the most extreme scenario. You what don't is, hear about what's, it. What, what's the most extreme scenarios? The most extreme scenario was the 90th percentile of RCP 8.5. Okay. So they not only RCP 8.5. But, but the, the top, 90th percent. <laughs> yeah. And so that but, one disappeared from the most recent. But like how, but like how many feet? Like That was, I think, 2.5 meters by 2100. That's pretty big. Um, yeah. yeah. And so, you know, the 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 estimates now are less than a meter, um, you know, at the upper end. So, yeah. so I mean, I think that's, again. It's, it's not going, nothing. It's, it's not, not nothing. nothing. It's going to happen. It's... Yeah. But it's, it's, and sea level rise should, in theory, be the most, um, easy thing to adapt to because we can see it easy. coming we yeah. know where it's going to where it's going <laughs> to happen it's not a, it's not a tidal wave that just chases you off the beach all of a sudden yeah like tomorrow yeah. like the day after tomorrow right <laughs> it's it reminds you of that austin powers uh scene where like the, the like the, the the truck or whatever is like like slowly inching toward him and right. he's like screaming ah! like, I can't, <laughs> yeah. he can't, he can't like get out right. of the way of it it's right. like why don't you just walk away from it it's 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 like that's not how this will be so right. okay so you're telling people you should uh, buy beachfront property but buy it like two blocks in um <laughs> <Right. laughs> it'd be solid um all right so I, I was just i was i was curious what the what the latest yeah, yeah. Was that. but but i mean as far as argumentation goes yeah this is this is sort of what we've all settled on as well and, and maybe it's why republicans uh now seek you out more than democrats because republicans are like wait wait, wait a second if the, if the goal is just to decrease emissions then and coal has doubled the emissions of natural gas why don't we start th like there's a, there's some like really right. low-hanging fruit Right. You know, we, we already did it in America because because you got to be you got to live in with, within reality. And this is the right. difference between rational and radical environmentalists is rational lives in, in within reality about like, the, the, like there's an economic component to this. There's an energy reliability component to this. Also, there's a the, the thing I the thing we're talking about a lot on the Energy and Commerce Committee is we don't debate climate change at all. We We debate energy, like as you said. And the other thing I point out is like, are you sure it's environmentally more friendly to put a 50 acres of solar panels out there? Because here's the thing, like, how do you make those things? It takes 10 times more earth excavation to make those things. And you're not excavating that earth with, um, I don't know, clean energy technology. You're doing it with big trucks and, and, you know, caterpillar cranes and whatever, and dump trucks and all sorts of things. And you're doing it in China, um, probably with slave labor. And or the Congo, where you're, where you're, where you, we, yeah, you, you also slave labor and children going down into mines and then, you know, dying soon thereafter by an, an untold amount, untold amount of human misery that is caused by getting this cobalt out of the Congo um, to make some of these batteries and, and things that we need to make this system work. So, 
you know, part of this, part of what we're doing a lot in Congress is just unpacking a more honest conversation about what the costs and benefits are of all of these, all of these different types of fuels. Um, there's an energy density question that's really important when you're talking about energy security and what what should be put on the grid. And it's like, wait a second, it takes all of this effort and land and material and additional carbon emissions that you don't count in the process to get this unit of energy. But that unit of energy, but I can, but that unit of energy is literally like in this bottle of gasoline. Right. So which one makes more sense? <laughs> like it's, well, I found in energy policy discussions, debates, I mean, I, I always compare it to like the NFL. Everybody has their favorite team, right? Oh, I'm a wind and solar guy. Oh, I'm a nuclear person. Oh, I like fossil fuels. And, 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 they cheer for their team. They cheer against the other teams. And the reality is, you know, nuclear is going to work some. It's got to work in Japan, and they're they're coming back to nuclear. It's probably not going to work in Australia or Germany anytime soon because of public opinion. Um, folks in Georgia are set um, with the Vogel plant coming on, and they have you know cost certainty for the next eighty years on their electricity. Um, you know, in Idaho, they're trying out modular nuclear, and so the reality is, um, you, like you say. We need an honest accounting of the short term, not only the costs and benefits, but the environmental effects, the human rights effects, the national security effects of different energy technologies. And the reality is, is fossil fuels are going to be with us at some level for a long time. Um, but there's a role for wind. There's a big role for solar. There's probably, if we ever want to decarbonize deeply, nuclear needs to have a big role there. And then there's technologies that we don't have yet, like carbon capture or big battery storage um, or fusion or whatever it happens to be. So, you know, I'm generally pretty optimistic about innovation and technology. And I think energy, we should be pretty optimistic on. But none of this, in my view, is going to happen you know, like that, it's, you know, the, the world tomorrow, next year, five years from now, it's going to a lot, a lot like this world. And so, you know, when people, when I do see the just stop oil protesters and the, you know, the, we have to shrink the GDP, um, you know, it consumes a lot of oxygen, but it's, it's definitely not helpful because, you know, if, if people in France are protesting with yellow vests over a few, few Euro cents increase in, in fuel duty, um, you know, folks in, in, in the African continent are, are, are just going to say no to austerity and and they already and have I mean, yeah. I mean, it's like it was, it was a big thing of the cop 26 yeah um you know it's just it's, i mean i'm i'm a team nuclear i mean i'm a, I'm a kind of team all of the i'm not against yep. solar wind but it, it's hard it is hard for me to be for it yep. because because i do understand the supply chains and i do yep. understand the, the 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 production process and i look at it and i'm just like i don't know man it, it doesn't mean you should be oh, like if you're in the desert and it's just sunny right. all the time and there's there's really no cost to putting a shit ton of solar panels right. in this area because there's nothing in the area. Okay. Yeah. All right. I, I, I can get behind that. Um, wind is the same thing, I guess. Like we have a bunch of it in West Texas. Yeah. However, you know, there's, there's, there's grid reliability problems right. there and it, it, it makes our electricity more, it, your electricity becomes more expensive when you put renewables on it in any grid. This is, this is hundred percent true all of the time. And it would be way worse if it wasn't vastly subsidized. So right. You know, the, the, and then and then it's also you have reliability issues. Then you have you have deinvestment in baseload energy. So there's there's other problems associated right, with right. it. Even if I don't care about the location of the wind turbines, yeah. you know, and I you know because they're out in the middle of nowhere, and nobody's looking at them. Um, but they're killing birds still, so that's a problem. But you know, anyway, it, it's got it's a cost and benefit conversation. I love the idea of, of nuclear. I think you know it's and we're we're definitely going to be working on that kind of legislation to. Yeah. To just improve the permitting process, improve the because right now it's an overhead cost. It's so that's right. so non belief that, it, that nobody wants to invest in it. Right. But these have to be the rational conversations. Um, otherwise, we just we just <laughs> I don't know what we do. We, we're, we're doing a lot of dumb things like Germany's doing. Otherwise, you deindustrialize and you probably ruin your country for the next two hundred years. Yeah, because that's hard to recover from. Yeah. Well, I mean, J Japan's learning that lesson after Fukushima. I mean, rightly, they were afraid of nuclear and they shut down whatever 57 nuclear power plants, um, but they're all coming back. Um, 57? Not every I think it was 57 they had that they... Uh, they I mean, you know, were they, they even rightly afraid of it? Who died? I thought no one died. Right. 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 Like, it's like zero deaths from right. this incident. Right. Like, well, if you look, clear. yeah, if you look at the data, I mean, nuclear is, is you know, objectively you know one of if not the safest given the the amount of of electricity that you can you can get out of it but you know i i have no no quarrel with somebody who's afraid of nuclear um and you know i say if you're afraid of nuclear and you're afraid of climate change you know pick one because guess what yeah. nuclear nuclear has a, a a big bang for the buck as far as carbon 
uh, yeah. reduction. So, yeah, so people are afraid that. of, you know, people are afraid of flying. They're afraid. I mean, and that's okay. That's natural. But we also have to recognize that, you know, if we take technologies off the table, it limits our choices. Let's take a step back. We have a few minutes left. I kind of went yeah. well, about an hour, but went a little longer than I told you we'd go. But um, let's take a step back and go back to the 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 state of the scientific community yep. at the moment. You've you've been in it for how many decades? What changes have you seen? There, there's a lot of skepticism of the experts these days, right? COVID policy had a lot to do with that. A lot. Um, one of the reasons COVID policy was, was or that era was so egregious for the so-called experts was also politicians fault because, you know, a health, a public health uh, official or scientist is, is always going to focus on one specific yeah. metric, like, like spread of an infection. And then it's up to the politician to be like, well, that's not the only factor. That's not the only factor. There are other factors that must be considered with public policy. But that's not how politicians acted. Well, if they were Democrats anyway, um, they, that's not how they acted. They said, this is the only thing we care about. And so we'll do everything to stop that specific metric. But it's like, wait a second. What about kids learning? What about, you know, what, what about maybe, maybe changing policy based on, you know, the, the fact that people who are, are older or more susceptible, et cetera. So that, that skepticism is, and then there was the medications and treatments that were just sort of lied about or thrown out the window or whatever. There was a lot, um, you know, selling people that a vaccine has no problems whatsoever when all vaccines always have some kind of risk. Like just be, just be a little bit more honest and people will trust you. Just, 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 <laughs> and, you know, and so, and so on just in general, I mean, you don't have to talk about COVID, but you know, maybe on the, on the climate side of things, are things getting better on this front? Or worse, because I mean, this radical alarmism has been going on since since you know Al Gore in two thousand. <laughs> yeah, it's, so so what I've seen over my career is the the biggest factor is the the, the increase in partisanship within the scientific community, and it's no secret academia and large parts of the U.S. science community lean left. Um, and it was really, I think, it was like the two thousand four election when when Nobel Prize winners. Um, U.S. Nobel Prize winners came out and signed a statement supporting Kerry, um, and the, you know, and, and Barack Obama came into office and he said, you know, we're going to restore science to its rightful place. And I think a lot of people in the scientific communities took that as an indication, like, hey, we're supposed to cheer for Democrats. If you look at um, you know views of the scientific community in the 1960s, go back that far, um, it was pretty, you know, pretty down the middle, you know, Republicans yeah. and Democrats. Um, I just finished um, a big project looking at science advice and COVID, and probably one of the most significant failures of the United States. We don't have a high-level scientific advisory committee on COVID. So, so Donald Trump had his coronavirus um, group, which was just political appointees, and Tony Fauci, he wasn't a <laughs> political appointee at the time he is now, or he was recently. Um, and, you know, when Dr. Fauci went, I think, to the New York Times, and he said, hey, I'm not an economist. You know, of course, I'm going to talk about public health. It's the job of of the administration, and it, I fault Trump and Biden on this, to put together a high level expert advisory body that integrates mm -hmm. knowledge yes. for people like you, cross functional, like, like right ec economists here, soci sociologists yeah. here, exactly. educators here. Like, hey, this is this is a problem. If you if you mask two year olds. And right. you mask everyone around a two-year-old. This is when this is when they're learning to speak. They can't see you make the words. Right. This is you just set them back massively in their lives. And and what's right. their risk from COVID? Zero. Right. It's pretty damn close to zero. Right. Like, what the hell are we doing? Right. Well, this is where I mean, in the in the lack of and again, expert advisory bodies like the IPCC or a COVID advisory body, they're imperfect and they may get things wrong. But at least you have them as a as a touch point. And so in the U.S., if you want to know, is it is it a good idea to shut down schools um, during COVID or not? Well, everybody has their opinion. But if the experts say, all right, we reviewed the studies. Here's your options, Mr. Crenshaw. You can do option A with these expected outcomes, B, C, D. Um, but instead, we that's we how we do the military. That's how we do intelligence and, yeah. and strategic planning in the military, because there is no partisanship to that. Yep. And so that's where I come from. That's yeah, like yeah. the community I come from. So I'm expecting different COAs, uh, courses yeah, yeah. of action. And then like, yeah. and then there's, there's, there's an assessed, there's an assessed, there's a most likely scenario. There's a, there's a most dangerous course of action. There's a most, there's a least dangerous uh, course of action. Like, well, maybe if they get flat tires, they won't come kill you. Like, right. you know, you, you think yeah. through literally every single one right. of those. Right. 
but maybe but maybe a goat herder sees you and then they get you to you faster like that's also right. a possibility that you have to account for right and we think through that you know and so uh, and people ask me like how does the military help you in this it's that it's the problem yeah. solving a process that we do because our lives depend on it and therefore there's no there, there's no biases yeah um that's I often not happening the, right now i often use the military and people you know i do a lot of work on science advice and people say you know where, where do we do it well and I, the number one example I cite is the military, um, you know, probably because there's, you know, immediate life and death consequences to decisions. So you, you can't pretend. Um, and yeah. you, Although that's, that's sort starting of to thing. change too, with some of yeah. this kind of silly, woke diversity stuff. It's not as bad as people think it is, but it's, it's bad enough where you've got to address it because right now, right. It, it's mostly a peacetime problem. Any, yeah. anytime we're like really not busy. Yeah people start making themselves busy and they're like, Oh my God, I've got it. But what about this social justice cause that I could just go ran on, rant on about this air force general just did it. So I'm recently thinking about it and it really annoyed me because it was so over the top and foolish and unscientific and just all of the above. Um, but when we're back at war, usually it's like everybody locks down and it's okay. Yeah. It's, it's life or death again. But yeah, I mean, the, whether it's COVID or, or climate science, I mean, climate science always seems to be going in these sort of, ups and downs like you know it was it was it was it was it was the, the next ice age was coming at some point it was the ozone layer it was the rainforest it was now it's then it was global warming but now then they don't even say global warming they say climate change and and so it, it just makes people a little skeptical um mostly because you're also asking for to impose enormous costs on them yeah there, i mean a part of that i think this is an achilles heel of the environmental movement is and it goes back a long time this idea that you have to create fear and you create fear by warning of the apocalypse. And um, it makes it really difficult to deal with persistent problems that are probably lower levels, but significant, but they're not going to end the world tomorrow. And, and, so. and, you, and, you'd, and you'd hear statements like that leaked from people who are yeah. pushing this. They'll say, no, we have to scare them. Yeah. And then that is like, I don't think they realize how damaging that is to, yeah. to well, they do realize that they must, how damaging that is to, you know what they might honestly trying to be do in a good faith way like it's just it's just it's because it makes people not want to listen to another word that they right. say well i'll give you an example so i've been writing with colleagues on the rcp 8.5 as an extreme outdated scenario and one of the critiques one of the pushbacks we get from from our colleagues is yeah but what if that was helpful in getting people concerned about climate change and my response is, is science is not designed to be helpful to a political cause. Science is there yeah. to, to call it like we see it. And then, you know, let the politicians figure out how they turn the facts, the science right. into policy options, um, because it, next time they won't trust us. Because um, it is up to us to, based on those facts, ascertain what the trade-offs are that yeah. we are willing to take. And based on public preference, based on a whole bunch of other factors, whether those are again, economic, social, et cetera, that, that is our job. And like, that's the proper partnership between right. science and politics. Yeah. And in the end, it's politicians who have screwed that up the most because in the end they're in charge. Right. And if you, if you want to set up a proper scientific advisory right. committee, whether it's to deal with COVID or, or whether it's to understand transgender issues and whether they should be doing it to minors or whether it's to understand climate change and, and energy right. policy, then it's up to you to to use your judgment and and come up with solutions based on trade-offs. And that's politics in a nutshell. Right. Examining trade-offs. Great. Yeah. That might be a good place to to end. That was a pretty solid uh conclusion. Yeah. Well, I agree. <laughs> right? That's great. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Um hey, well, hey, thanks for coming on, Roger. My pleasure. Um, thanks for having me. It's Dr. Fun. Roger Pielke, this was the fantastic um Good to know. Uh, I think people hear about uh, UC Boulder and they're like, yeah, right. There's not going to be anybody I want to talk to there. But look, <laughs> look who's there. Um, you know, and I didn't even ask. You, I don't even know what your political leanings are, honestly. I mean, yeah, you're being invited by Republicans to testify. But I, I find often that on this particular debate, I we are partnering with liberals like like Michael Schellenberger is a liberal. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Um, you know, who, but who are just interested in the truth. And like, we can disagree on other things, agree on some things and, and, but, but, but the goal should be truth. So I appreciate you coming on and just be, and being a voice for truth. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity.